horrific monsters of the Bible that no one can escape from. Number 1. Behemoth The Behemoth We see this great beast in the book of Job. God himself speaks of the beast. The tale begins with Job, a wealthy man living in the land of Uz with his large family and numerous flocks. Renowned for his moral integrity, he is described as blameless and upright, always endeavoring to lead a righteous life. He had a very disciplined relationship with God. God commends Job's righteousness to Satan, but Satan contends that Job's virtue is merely a result of God's favor. Boldly, Satan challenges God, proposing that if he were permitted to inflict suffering upon Job, Job would forsake his faith and curse God. Though God allows Satan to test Job's resolve, he prohibits Satan from taking Job's life. This spells catastrophe for Job. Job receives four reports in one day, each notifying him his sheep, servants, and ten children have all died due to thieving invaders or natural disasters. Amid his suffering, Job rips his clothes and shaves his head, but in his prayers, he continues to praise God. After a while, Satan comes back to heaven, and God gives him another chance to test Job. This time, Job gets really sick with painful skin rashes. Even though he's hurting, Job's wife tells him to give up and curse God. But Job decides to keep going and deal with the pain instead. The story has two parts going on, one in heaven and one on earth, kind of like how things happen in the book of Revelation. Job gets really upset and wishes he was never born, thinking life just makes everything worse. He's confused about why God judges people by their actions when God could easily forgive them. Job doesn't understand God's ways. As Job goes through all this, he gets more and more upset, feeling like God is being unfair by letting bad things happen to good people. He wants to talk to God and complain, but he can't find him. Still, Job decides to try and do the right thing and avoid doing anything bad. Finally, God steps in. After Job keeps praying, God talks to him during a storm. Job realizes he's not important compared to God and stops arguing. Later on, God talks to Job again, but this time he talks about his creatures. It's like God is saying that even animals can teach us important things about life. This is not the only beast God talks about. To watch another beast God discusses, watch till the end. Job 40 verses 15 to 24 Take a look at Behemoth, which I made just as I made you. It eats grass like an ox. See its powerful loins and the muscles of its belly. Its tail is as strong as a cedar. The sinews of its thighs are knit tightly together. Its bones are tubes of bronze. Its limbs are bars of iron. It is a prime example of God's handiwork, and only its creator can threaten it. The mountains offer it their best food, where all the wild animals play. It lies under the lotus plants, hidden by the reeds in the marsh. The lotus plants give it shade among the willows beside the stream. It is not disturbed by the raging river, nor concerned when the swelling Jordan rushes around it. No one can catch it off guard, or put a ring in its nose and lead it away. Previously, the focus was more on the mystery of the animal creation. However, now the focus has shifted to the fear and yet the magnificence of God's creations. The behemoth was first among the works of God, as we see in verse 19. This refers to Genesis 1 verse 21, where the first animals mentioned are the great sea creatures. As stated in verse 19, the behemoth was the first of God's creations. Genesis 1 verse 21 so God created great sea creatures and every living thing that scurries and swarms in the water, and every sort of bird, each producing offspring of the same kind, and God saw that it was good. The Identity of the Behemoth 
The behemoth is one of a handful of Bible creatures that historians have argued about for quite a while. The scholarly community is still trying to come up with a consensus on many aspects of this creature, but they do know two things. He was enormous and had a belly button. The evidence of a belly button shows that it is not an animal that lays eggs. We read he eats grass like an ox. His power is in his stomach muscles. God seems to take great pleasure in describing the marvel of this extraordinary creature, pointing out its size, appetite, and behaviors along the way. The picture is clear. If Job cannot contend with this fellow creature, how could he ever contend with the God who created the behemoth? The Hebrew word behemoth has the same form as the plural of the Hebrew noun behemoth, meaning beast, suggesting an augmentative meaning great beast. The word of God makes it very clear who created this great beast. John 1 verse 3 God created everything through him, and nothing was created except through him. Behemoth, according to ancient texts, was created by God himself. God is said to be the source of all creation, including humans, animals, planets, and angels. Everything you see and even things you can't. As the creator, God is superior to everything he made. Now, people wonder what behemoth might have been. Some think it could have been a hippopotamus, a huge and powerful creature known in biblical times, especially in Egypt. Hippos were even a problem for the Romans because they harmed crops. Others think behemoth might have been an elephant. People who believe this say that behemoth in Hebrew could mean a four-legged beast, which matches an elephant. But there are some differences. In the book of Job, behemoth is described as having a tail like a cedar tree, which doesn't match an elephant's small tail. Also, Behemoth is described as so big and strong that people couldn't control it, which is different from elephants, which have been used by humans for thousands of years. These descriptions don't really match any animals we have today. Throughout history, humans have hunted and used elephants for work and war, but they've always been able to control them. So, Behemoth remains a mystery, showing the amazing power of God's creation. When the book of Job described the behemoth as the chief of the ways of God, so powerful that only he that made him can make his sword to approach onto him, it was no exaggeration. It is worth noting that the description in Job does not include any mention of tusks or horns. This could imply that it is not an elephant or a typical rhinoceros, as those distinct features characterize those animals. Following their conversation about the terrifying behemoth, God prompted Job to examine yet another terrifying monster. Number 2. The Four Beasts of Daniel In the book of Daniel, there's a vision that the prophet records given to him by God. In this vision, Daniel sees four powerful world empires represented by four different beasts. The vision tells us that these empires will have authority for a specific period, but eventually they will come to an end and the holy people of the Most High will receive the kingdom and will possess it forever. Yes, forever and ever. Have you thought about why we study Bible prophecy? Firstly, it helps us to see how God's word was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. It also gives us confidence in the promises God makes for our future. When we see how God kept his promises in the past, it helps us trust in what he says about what's to come. Daniel 7 marks the start of a new part of the book of Daniel. These prophecies are about thrones and kingdoms, placing us not just in Bible prophecy, but also in world history. God holds the future in his hands so it's important to include him in our plans through prayer. Without God's involvement, our plans may be in vain, but when we seek God's guidance and we receive confirmation and peace, we should act accordingly. Obedience shows our trust in God. 
Daniel experiences great distress from the vision of the four beasts until an angel explains its meaning to him. Even after understanding, the vision still troubles Daniel, causing him to keep his thoughts to himself and feel deeply troubled. Daniel's vision of the four beasts begins with a windy night and a troubled sea. As Daniel watches, the first of Daniel's four beasts is like a lion and it had the wings of an eagle. In my vision that night, I, Daniel, saw a great storm churning the surface of a great sea, with strong winds blowing in every direction. Then, four huge beasts came up out of the water, each different from the others. The first beast was like a lion with eagle's wings. As I watched, its wings were pulled off, and it was left standing on its two hind feet on the ground like a human being, and it was given a human mind. Then I saw a second beast, and it looked like a bear. It was rearing up on one side, and it had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And I heard a voice say to it, Get up, devour the flesh of many people. Then the third of these strange beasts appeared, and it looked like a leopard, it had four birds' wings on its back, and it had four heads. Great authority was given to this beast. Daniel 7, verses 2 to 6. We read, Stirring up the great sea. The location mentioned in the vision, most likely the Mediterranean Sea, holds significance because each empire described in the vision had a geographical connection to it. For the Hebrew people, the sea represented danger and mystery, yet they believed that God had power over it. The sea is sometimes used as a symbol for Gentile nations in biblical literature, emphasizing their restless and unpredictable nature. Psalm 89 verse 9 You rule the oceans, you subdue their storm-tossed waves. A description of the three beasts. The first beast in Daniel's vision resembled a lion, representing the Babylonian Empire. This empire was depicted as majestic like a lion, which symbolizes kingship and power. However, it was later humbled, and its wings were plucked off and a human heart was given to it. Daniel later explains that these four beasts symbolize four kingdoms ruling over the earth. The Babylonian Empire, led by Nebuchadnezzar, fits perfectly as the first kingdom represented by the lion and eagle. Jeremiah also used the lion and eagle imagery to describe Nebuchadnezzar's authority, and relics like Babylon's winged lions can still be found today at places like the British Museum. Jeremiah 49 verses 19 to 22 I will come like a lion from the thickets of the Jordan, leaping on the sheep in the pasture. I will chase Edom from its land, and I will appoint the leader of my choice. For who is like me, and who can challenge me? What ruler can oppose my will? Listen to the Lord's plan against Edom, and the people of Taman. Even the little children will be dragged off like sheep, and their homes will be destroyed. The earth will shake with the noise of Edom's fall, and its cry of despair will be heard all the way to the Red Sea. Look, the enemy swoops down like an eagle, spreading his wings over Bozra. Even the mightiest warriors will be in anguish, like a woman in labor. A second, like a bear. The second beast in Daniel's vision was not as majestic as the lion or the eagle. Instead, it was like a bear, known for its strength and power, with a voracious appetite for conquest. This bear represented the Medo Persian Empire, which came after the Babylonian Empire. In this empire, the Persians were dominant, symbolized by the bear's partnership between the Medes and the Persians. The three ribs often seen with the bear are believed to represent the empire's three major military conquests Babylon, Egypt, and Lydia. The Medo Persian armies were known for their slow and crushing tactics, overwhelming their enemies with their sheer size and strength. They were compared to a bear due to their cruelty and thirst for blood, 
as bears are known to be voracious and fierce animals. We read, Arise, devour much flesh. The command for the bear to arise and devour much flesh highlights the extreme cruelties commonly associated with the Persians and the vast extent of their conquests. It's worth noting that historically the Median Kingdom was contemporary with the Babylonian Empire and even rose to power before the Neo-Babylonian period. However, the Median Kingdom never attained the same level of global influence as the Persian, Greek, or Babylonian empires. Some interpretations aim to exclude any reference to Rome and divine predictive prophecy, possibly motivated by various factors. The third beast. We read, another, like a leopard. The leopard in Daniel's vision was known for its sudden and unexpected attacks symbolizing the Greek Empire. This empire, led by Alexander the Great, conquered vast territories at an astonishing speed by the age of 28. Alexander's conquests stretched from Europe to the Indian Ocean, making him one of history's most successful conquerors. After Alexander's death, his empire was divided into four parts, represented by the four heads of the leopard. These divisions were ruled by his generals. Cassander, Lysimachus, Seleucus, and Ptolemy. During Daniel's time, the Babylonian Empire was dominant, so one might have expected the next empire to be the Medo-Persian Empire, especially during the reign of Belshazzar. However, Daniel's vision accurately foretold the rise and division of the Greek Empire, demonstrating God's ability to know and reveal the future through his prophets. This underscores the fact that God exists beyond our concept of time and has a comprehensive view of human history. The fulfillment of such prophecies provides compelling evidence of God's omniscience and sovereignty. Because of that experience, we have even greater confidence in the message proclaimed by the prophets. You must pay close attention to what they wrote, for their words are like a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and Christ the morning star shines in your hearts. The fourth beast, a dreadful horned beast with one conspicuous horn. Daniel 7 verses 7 to 8 Then in my vision that night, I saw a fourth beast, terrifying, dreadful and very strong. It devoured and crushed its victims with huge iron teeth and trampled their remains beneath its feet. It was very different from any of the other beasts. It had ten horns. As I was looking at the horns, suddenly another small horn appeared among them. Three of the first horns were torn out by the roots to make room for it. This little horn had eyes like human eyes and a mouth that was boastingly arrogant. The fourth beast, dreadful and terrible. The fourth beast in Daniel's vision was so terrifying and powerful that it defied description. It had ten horns, symbolizing its strength and dominance. In ancient times, horns represented the power and fierceness of an animal, and this beast was so formidable that it had ten horns. Different interpretations suggest that these ten horns could have been two five-pointed antlers, or ten separate horns. Historically, this fourth beast represents the Roman Empire, which was the largest, strongest, most unified and enduring of all the empires mentioned. There is a clear connection between these ten horns and the ten toes of the dream image in chapter 2 of Daniel. The mention of iron in the teeth of the beast suggests a similarity to the legs and toes of iron in that image. Based on the interpretation that the Antichrist emerges from the fourth beast in Daniel's vision, it's speculated that, in the end times, there will be a revival of the Roman Empire. This revival would involve a coalition of ten world leaders, similar to the ten horns on the fourth beast. The Antichrist would rise to power within this coalition, supplanting three of the leaders to take a position of global authority. As a tyrant, the Antichrist would demand worship and seek to control all aspects of life. 
This interpretation suggests a scenario where the Antichrist establishes a totalitarian regime, exerting control over people's beliefs, behaviors, and daily activities. Revelation 13 verses 16 to 17 He requires everyone, small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to be given a mark on the right hand or on the forehead, and no one could buy or sell anything without that mark, which was either the name of the beast or the number representing his name. Indeed, there is a significant parallel between the little horn in Daniel 7 and the first beast described in Revelation 13. Both figures are associated with ten horns, suggesting a connection between them. The description of the beast in Revelation, resembling a leopard but with features of a bear and a lion, mirrors the characteristics of the beasts mentioned in Daniel's vision. This similarity reinforces the idea that these visions in Daniel and Revelation are related and may be describing the same future events. The imagery of the leopard, bear, and lion, combined with the ten horns, symbolizes a powerful and menacing force that emerges in the end times. The convergence of these descriptions across different prophetic texts underscores the significance of these events in eschatological prophecy. Revelation 13 verse 2 This beast looked like a leopard, but it had the face of a bear and the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave the beast his own power and throne and great authority. In simpler terms, the beast mentioned in Revelation combines features from all of Daniel's beasts. Like Daniel's fourth beast, John's beast speaks arrogantly and oppresses God's people for three and a half years. This shows how the visions in both Daniel and Revelation share common themes, emphasizing the importance of these prophecies in understanding future events. Revelation 13 verses 5 to 7 Then the beast was allowed to speak great blasphemies against God, and he was given authority to do whatever he wanted for forty-two months. And he spoke terrible words of blasphemy against God, slandering his name and his dwelling, that is, those who dwell in heaven. And the beast was allowed to wage war against God's holy people and to conquer them. And he was given authority to rule over every tribe and people and language and nation. The good news is that the reign of the Antichrist is limited, 42 months and no more. Then God promises to judge the little horn, or, as John saw it, the beast was captured and was thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. The Son of Man will rule forever. Daniel 7 verse 26 But then the court will pass judgment, and all his power will be taken away and completely destroyed. Revelation 19 verse 20 And the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet who did mighty miracles on behalf of the beast, miracles that deceived all who had accepted the mark of the beast and who worshipped his statue. Both the beast and his false prophet were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. It is interesting to compare Daniel's vision of the four beasts with King Nebuchadnezzar's dream of a large statue. Both visions symbolize the same kingdoms of the world. In Daniel 2, the king dreams of the earthly kingdoms as an enormous, dazzling statue, awesome in appearance. Daniel 2 verse 31 In your vision, your majesty, you saw standing before you a huge, shining statue of a man. It was a frightening sight. However, Daniel sees the same kingdoms as hideous beasts. So, we have two very different perspectives on the kingdoms mankind builds. The rulers of the world see their kingdoms as imposing, artistic monuments fashioned of valuable metals. However, God's prophets view the same kingdoms as unnatural monsters. Daniel's vision of the four beasts warned Israel that there would be a procession of enemies and world rulers holding authority over them. However, they should not lose heart. In the end, God is in control, and the Messiah to come will defeat the kingdoms of this world and establish his throne forever.
Daniel 2 verse 44. During the reigns of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed or conquered. It will crush all these kingdoms into nothingness, and it will stand forever. Daniel 7 verses 13 to 14. As my vision continued that night, I saw someone like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient One and was led into His presence. He was given authority, honor, and sovereignty over all the nations of the world, so that people of every race and nation and language would obey Him. His rule is eternal. It will never end. His kingdom will never be destroyed. Revelation 11 verse 15 Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices shouting in heaven, the world has now become the kingdom of our Lord and His Christ, and He will reign forever and ever. Number 3. The Locusts of Abaddon Many people do not know that this is in the Word of God. Certain powerful beings in the Word of God have been contemplated for centuries, from the Prince of Persia, which faced Angel Michael and another angel during the Daniel prophecy arc, to the legion of demons that Jesus cast away from the demoniac. However, there is a powerful being that Apostle John shared with us. This being is yet to come, and his appearance is a thing of nightmares, pain, and torture. Apostle John has left us with a vivid description of a powerful being who is yet to come. This being's appearance is so terrifying that it could instill fear and cause miseries to anyone who hears about him. The being causes immense pain and distress to those involved. Who will face this powerful being? Will Archangel Michael or Jesus come to defeat this being? Or will God himself allow this powerful being to run around? Apostle John shares this prophecy from the island of Patmos in the powerful book of Revelation. This is where we find out about Abaddon. In scripture, Revelation is the unveiling of what is hidden from humanity but known to God. There are some things which man cannot know unless God chooses to inform him. Revelation chapters 6 to 16 covers Satan on earth. This particular segment can be challenging to comprehend and put into practice. Unfortunately, we have arrived at the unpleasant part. The situation will deteriorate before any improvement can be seen. It is reassuring to know that the scenario described in these chapters is the worst-case scenario. Nevertheless, it is still distressing. The judgments are going to be carried out in three steps. Each step is brought about in an epic fashion. The first are called seals, the second trumpets, and the third bowls. The first four of the seven seals open, releasing what are known as the four horsemen of the apocalypse because the judgments appear metaphorically as a horse and rider leaving destruction in their path. Then the trumpets begin. In Revelation 8-9, John describes a time near the end of the world where angels sound seven trumpets. Each trumpet heralds the arrival of a new round of judgment on the people of the earth. Following the fourth trumpet judgment, the fifth trumpet. It is here we see the locusts. The fifth trumpet brings demonic locusts from the bottomless pit. The day the door to the abyss is opened is a day of intense judgment. But what is the abyss and what lies in there? In Jewish theology and the Bible, the abyss is often used metaphorically to refer to the dwelling place of evil spirits. In the Bible, the abyss is like a really deep hole or a huge gap often thought of as a place where the dead go, or a spot filled with total darkness and emptiness. This is also known to be a place that is really far away from God's presence and kindness. Luke 8 verse 31 talks about a moment when Jesus meets a man controlled by demons. When Jesus tells these evil spirits to leave the man, they are petrified and ask Jesus not to send them to the abyss. The abyss is a terrible place for evil spirits, where they would be punished and suffer. The opening of the abyss. This begins with a key, a symbol of power and authority. In Revelation 9 verse 1, the Bible says, Then the fifth angel blew his trumpet, and I saw a star that had fallen to earth from the sky. 
and he was given the key to the shaft of the bottomless pit. Revelation 9 verses 3 to 6 Then locusts came from the smoke and descended on the earth, and they were given power to sting like scorpions. They were told not to harm the grass or plants or trees, but only the people who did not have the seal of God on their foreheads. They were told not to kill them, but to torture them for five months with pain like the pain of a scorpion sting. In those days, people will seek death but will not find it. They will long to die, but death will flee from them. These locusts are not natural. They avoid plants and attack humans like scorpions. They represent the hordes of demons unleashed upon the earth. Those who have the seal of God on their foreheads are protected but none other are. This is an inescapable judgment of God. The purpose of these locusts and period is expressly governed by God, and the purpose of all this is to bring repentance, but it will severely fail. Revelation 9 verses 20 to 21 But the people who did not die in these plagues still refused to repent of their evil deeds and turn to God. They continued to worship demons and idols made of gold, silver, bronze, stone, and wood. Idols that can neither see nor hear nor walk, and they will not repent of their murders, or their witchcraft, or their sexual immorality, or their thefts. This star opened the abyss, Revelation 9 verse 2, unleashing a battalion of demonic soldiers likened to a plague of locusts, resembling hordes prepared for battle. Revelation 9 verse 7 Death will offer no escape from this prolonged torture. The strength of their attacks has been compared to that of scorpions, which, despite the excruciating pain they cause, seldom result in the victim's death. The tormented ones want to pass. For Paul, death was the gateway to eternal blessing. Nevertheless, for those who are already being tormented, Death is a transition from the present pain into the eternal fire that awaits them. Note that the sound of the locusts is reminiscent of the mighty army approaching the nation. This seems to be the reason for using this number of months for the duration of the torment. The anguish and agony won't last for just a few days, but rather as long as the locusts continue to exist in the world. The only way to end this attack of Abaddon's locusts is for the attackers to finish wreaking their destruction. The torment is so excruciating that it is comparable to the venom of a scorpion, and the suffering will be so severe that people will wish they were dead. They will look for death, but they will not discover it. Revelation 9 verses 7 to 10 The locusts look like horses prepared for battle. They had what looked like gold crowns on their heads, and their faces looked like human faces. They had hair like women's hair and teeth like the teeth of a lion. They wore armor made of iron, and their wings roared like an army of chariots rushing into battle. They had tails that stung like scorpions, and for five months they had the power to torment people. Why would God refer to them as locusts if they are not actual locusts, but rather demonic spirits who swarm and destroy like locusts? Among other reasons, because locusts are considered agents of God's judgment in the Old Testament. 2 Chronicles 7 verse 13 At times I might shut up the heavens so that no rain falls, or command grasshoppers to devour your crops, or send plagues among you. We read, like horses, like gold, like the faces of men, like women's hair, like lion's teeth. The fact that the word like is used multiple times suggests that the intent is not to provide a literal description. The overall impression that is left by this picture is one of incredible and brutal cruelty. Think of them as locusts, but with a strong sting like scorpions. This makes them much more than just regular insects. Their emergence marked the beginning of a time of suffering and tribulation, a period where the forces of evil that were once contained in the abyss were now released upon the world. This emergence is not a random act of nature. It carries a specific and targeted mission. The locusts are commanded with a precise and unusual directive. Usually, when there's a swarm of locusts, they eat up lots of plants and crops, but these special locusts are different. 
they don't destroy plants. Instead, they go after certain people, those who don't have a special mark from God on their foreheads. This mark is like a sign of God's protection. This extraordinary event is not just about the physical appearance of these locust-like beings, but also about the deeper spiritual implications. It serves as a stark reminder of the choices people make and the consequences that follow. Those who bear the seal of God are spared, symbolizing the protection afforded to those who align with the divine will. In contrast, those without the seal face the wrath of these unique creatures, showing the danger of moving away from doing what is right and good. The emergence of the locusts, as depicted in the Bible, is a powerful narrative that intertwines the physical and spiritual realms. It's a revelation of divine judgment and protection, a manifestation of both wrath and mercy. It serves as a sobering reminder of the importance of faith and the reality of spiritual warfare in a world that often seems dominated by the tangible and the temporal. The leader of these locusts then arrives. There is a powerful and mysterious character called the King of the Abyss. This being is more than just a legend. It's a significant part of the Bible's stories about the end of the world. Revelation 9 verse 11 introduces him with a chilling clarity. Revelation 9 verse 11 Their king is the angel from the bottomless pit. His name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in Greek, Apollyon, the destroyer. We read, and they had as king over them. This is yet another piece of evidence suggesting that the creatures in question are not true locusts. According to the Bible, actual locusts do not have a king. The Bible says in Proverbs 30 verse 27 that although the locusts do not have a king, they all progress in ranks. However, this particular swarm of locusts does in fact have a king. To really get who this character is, we need to look closely at who he is known as. He's called the King of the Abyss. He's not like normal kings. He rules over a place called the Abyss, which is usually thought of as a place full of chaos and old, deep fears. The name Abaddon in Hebrew and Apollyon in Greek both translate to destroyer. These names are not mere labels, but reflections of his nature and the role he plays in the heavenly narrative. He is not just a destroyer of physical structures, but of ideals, hope, and possibly the moral values that hold societies together. His arrival means that everything starts to fall apart and the line between chaos and the real world begins to blur. In the wider context of the Bible, the King of the Abyss stands as a contrast to the themes of creation, order, and salvation that flow through the scriptures. Where God speaks of creating and sustaining, Abaddon speaks of ending and undoing. His role in the book of Revelation is particularly significant. He is a sign of the final judgment, showing us that earthly power doesn't last forever and that, in the end, God's fair judgment will always prevail. The image of locusts over which he rules is equally symbolic. In the Bible, locusts are often seen as instruments of divine wrath, agents of destruction that consume and devastate, as seen in the plagues of Egypt in Exodus. The king of the abyss who leads this large group represents a powerful and unavoidable force of judgment. Abaddon will not destroy all people. According to the book of Revelation, every person will either receive a mark from God or the mark of the beast. Revelation 13 verse 17 and no one could buy or sell anything without that mark, which was either the name of the beast or the number representing his name. This verse highlights that those who have faith and bear the seal of God are offered protection in the midst of the chaos. It highlights how strong faith can protect us from the evil that comes out of the abyss. In conclusion, the day the door of the abyss is opened stands as a testament to the dual nature of biblical prophecy. A moment of judgment and tribulation, yet also a time when faith becomes a crucial sanctuary. It reminds us of the importance of maintaining their faith and the hope that, even in the darkest of times, 
those who are sealed by God will find protection and ultimately redemption. This event is not just a warning of what is to come, but also an invitation to deepen one's faith and trust in God's divine plan. Number 4. The First Beast We are currently living in extraordinary, unanticipated and crucial moments. Millions of Christians across the world are going through difficult times. And only God knows what the future holds for our freedom as Christians. But the stranger and more threatening the times become, the more revelation, this final book of the scriptures, in all its strangeness, will feel as relevant as it is. In the book of Revelation, chapter 12 to 14, the final series of disasters is about to occur. It will be the toughest for the church. Even though their hold on civilization is about to be destroyed, demonic powers will get a more significant foothold in it than they have ever had before. Revelation chapters 12 to 14 introduce three individuals who come together to establish an alliance to rule the world on their own. One is angelic in origin and nature, a great dragon and ancient serpent, otherwise known as Satan or the devil. Revelation 12 verse 9 This great dragon, the ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, the one deceiving the whole world, was thrown down to the earth with all his angels. The other two are of human origin and nature, beasts, also known as Antichrist. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 3, he is also referred to as the man of lawlessness, and other passages refer to him as the false prophet. In an appalling parody of God, Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, the three work together to create a kind of unholy trinity. Satan is first introduced into the troubles. Since he was first mentioned in the letters that were sent to the seven churches, he has not been referenced in Revelation. The true battle between good and evil is taking place. Later, Satan will again be defeated and thrown into the abyss. Meanwhile, in the few years he has left, his rage and resentment are focused on our planet. Because he cannot engage God in direct conflict in heaven, he wages war on the people of God on earth. It is a defensive maneuver that is being carried out in the hope of sustaining his dominion on earth, utilizing puppet rulers, one of whom is political and the other religious. So far, the message of Revelation chapter 12 is quite clear, even if it taxes the imagination. The strangest chapter in this strangest book is chapter 13. Now let us examine the first 10 verses of Revelation 13, which are pretty unusual indeed. Revelation 13 verses 1 to 10 Then I saw a beast rising up out of the sea. It had seven heads and ten horns, with ten crowns on its horns. And written on each head were names of the blasphemed God. This beast looked like a leopard, but it had the feet of a bear and the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave the beast his own power and throne and great authority. I saw that one of the heads of the beast seemed wounded beyond recovery, but the fatal wound was healed. The whole world marveled at this miracle and gave allegiance to the beast. They worshipped the dragon for giving the beast such power, and they also worshipped the beast. Who is as great as the beast, they exclaimed, who is able to fight against him? Then the beast was allowed to speak great blasphemies against God, and he was given authority to do whatever he wanted for forty-two months, and he spoke terrible words of blasphemy against God, slandering his name and his dwelling, that is, those who dwell in heaven. And the beast was allowed to wage war against God's holy people and to conquer them, and he was given authority to rule over every tribe and people and language and nation. And all the people who belonged to this world worshipped the beast. They were the ones whose names were not written in the book of life that belongs to the lamb who was slaughtered before the world was made. Anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. Anyone who is destined for prison will be taken to prison. Anyone destined to die by the sword will die by the sword. This means that God's holy people must endure persecution patiently and remain faithful. The beast speaks blasphemies against God and aggressively oppresses the people of God wherever they may be found on earth. 
It not only rules the world, but receives the worship of its inhabitants. The first beast is a symbolic picture of the Antichrist, and the dragon is Satan. Revelation 12 verse 9 This great dragon, the ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, the one deceiving the whole world was thrown down to the earth with all his angels. Number 5. The Second Beast The second beast is a two-horned, deceptively innocent creature that disseminates power with the first beast. Then I saw another beast come out of the earth. He had two horns like those of a lamb, but he spoke with the voice of a dragon. He exercised all the authority of the first beast and he required all the earth and its people to worship the first beast, whose fatal wound had been healed. He did astounding miracles, even making fire flash down to earth from the sky while everyone was watching. And with all the miracles he was allowed to perform on behalf of the first beast, he deceived all the people who belonged to this world. He ordered the people to make a great statue of the first beast, who was fatally wounded and then came back to life. He was then permitted to give life to this statue so that it could speak. Then the statue of the beast commanded that anyone refusing to worship it must die. He required everyone, small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to be given a mark on the right hand or on the forehead. And no one could buy or sell anything without that mark, which was either the name of the beast or the number representing his name. Revelation 13 verses 11 to 17 the responsibility of the second beast is to promote the worship of the first beast among all people. As the second beast deceives the world with miracles, it orders that everyone set up an image in order of the beast who was wounded by the sword and yet lived. Everyone is required to acquire the mark of the beast, either in their right hand or on their forehead. The second beast is a symbolic picture of the false prophet. In Revelation chapter 13, the two beasts make their appearance. The first and most important one is a political person, specifically a global dictator, who rules all known ethnic subgroups under a totalitarian system. Note that anti, in Greek, means instead of, rather than against, meaning a counterfeit rather than a competitor, the man of lawlessness. 2 Thessalonians 2 verses 3 to 4 don't be fooled by what they say, for that day will not come until there is a great rebellion against God and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the one who brings destruction. He will exalt himself and defy everything that people call God and every object of worship. He will even sit in the temple of God, claiming that he himself is God. He acknowledged no higher law than his own will, and as a result, claimed divinity and demanded devotion as a result. The beast is a human person who gives in to Satan's temptation and accepts the offer that Jesus turned down. Matthew 4 verses 8 to 9 Next, the devil took him to the peak of a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. I will give it all to you, he said, if you will kneel down and worship me. Had he accepted, he would have become Jesus Antichrist. The beast is also anti-Christian, in the other sense of this prefix. He has the power to make war against the saints and overcome them. Revelation 13 verse 7 And the beast was allowed to wage war against God's holy people and to conquer them, and he was given authority to rule over every tribe and people and language and nation. He overcomes them temporarily but they conquer him eternally. Revelation 12 verse 11 And they have defeated him by the blood of the Lamb and by their testimony, and they did not love their lives so much that they were afraid to die. His characteristics are similar to those of other fearsome beasts such as leopards, bears and lions. He appears to be from a federation of political rulers who have captured the world's attention through an astonishing recovery from a fatal wound, most likely in an attempted assassination. For 42 months, his blasphemous egoism has been broadcast. The second beast strengthens his position as a religious colleague with supernatural power who directs the world's worship towards his superior.
His miracles such as commanding fire to fall from the sky and images of the dictator to speak will deceive the nations. The section about this beast concludes with a prophecy. Take note of the command to pay attention to this warning. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. Jesus used the same language to call people to listen to the important message he was about to teach. The same is true here in Revelation concerning this important message. If anyone is to be taken captive, to captivity he goes. If anyone is to be slain with the sword, with the sword he must be slain. In summary, this war that the beast will make against the saints is going to be very bad. You are going to be captured or killed. Therefore, Christ calls for faithful endurance. Here is a call for the endurance and faith of the saints. The world is standing for the beast, worshipping the beast and honouring the beast. The Christians will not do this and suffering will come from this.